I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, maybe we're a few minutes late and some people will come in later. So this session is titled Staying on the Right Side of Mapping. And my first talk is going to be talking about deterring and diffusing disputes. So my name is Ethan, and I'm part of the uh, OSM Foundation's Data Working Group, or I think better named is the Conflict Working Group, as opposed to Data Working Group. Um, I don't know, we'll see if we can change that name eventually. So, do disputes occur in OSM? Well, the answer is absolutely. Um, maybe as a brief sample here, I, I came up with some, some hypothetical ones. So, the first one, uh, here's the one-way uh, abandoned railroad we surveyed, and then the other person says, no, actually that was a tree row. Uh, the railway was one block to the south. So that's pretty easy to solve, right? You can go out, you can survey it. It's, it's yes or no there. But, you know, things can get maybe a, a little more hairy. So, how about we should add the name, uh, alt name, the six to Toronto, and then the other person says, do they say that on the ground? And the person replies, Drake does. So Drake is a rapper here, and he calls his hometown the six. So, I don't know, do they use that on the ground? Should we add it? That's a good question. So why do disputes uh, occur? I mean, we're a huge community. We've been learning all about uh, our smaller communities and coming together is a global one, but we're, we're a global project, really. And there's people from all different countries, different communities, all walks of life. They have different worldviews, different perspectives and life experiences. And so all of these, uh, you know, when, when we bring them together, it, it's to be expected that there are gonna be some conflicts or issues that might need to be resolved. So uh, I came up with a little methodology that, that you can use. Uh, it, it won't apply to all situations, but maybe something to approach disputes generally. So the first thing is really to engage the mappers in question or the things that are going on through, through discussions, uh, whether they be public through things like chain set comments here. So I have, whoops, an example here, uh, where someone made a comment on, on a change set, you know, hi, is this actually named Future Park Road, or is it uh, Nocta Park Road that's gonna be there in the future, that sort of thing. So just kind of opening dialogue, that, that's really an important part of the process. Um, and if it's from an area that you're really not from or you're not familiar with, also engaging other people from the community who are from there is really helpful. So when you use things like change set comments, you provide the avenue for those other people from the community to weigh in and provide either their input or their view of it. Uh, another thing uh, to keep in mind is just looking at the situation from the other mapper's point of view. Um, you know, things might not necessarily be interpreted the same way or uh, you might, uh, you know, uh, an example would be a tree row versus um, mapping a bunch of trees individually. So trying to, to, to keep an open mind to why they're mapping and what they're mapping. And then obviously when applicable, uh, all of these uh, past points kind of allude to this, but try to follow an on the ground solution. So OpenStreetMap is about concrete things, things that uh, are in the real world. So, so trying to follow that and apply that principle is a really good way um, to solving these problems. Or if that's maybe not uh, as straightforward, looking for an amicable solution. And then finally, if the problem persists, uh, that's where the data working group here uh, comes in real handy. And then most of all, through all your interactions, whether they, they be change set uh, comments or messages or, or forum posts or whatever, uh, the key thing is to be civil and friendly because we are community, we wanna, we wanna um, welcome everyone in the community and we wanna make sure that things uh, don't devolve into some sort of edit or, or flame war. So uh, I thought this would be a good opportunity to uh, bring Mikel up for a few minutes to speak about the situation and kind of the, the events surrounding the actual formation of the data working group. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Ethan, for asking me to I think, tell what's a, the origin story of how we do dispute resolution in OpenStreetMap and of the data working group. Um, some years ago, 2007, 2008, I believe on the talk mailing list, uh, a mapper um, st and started um, asking for help, uh, both on the mailing list and directly for an edit war in Northern Cyprus. 
Um, the political situation in northern Cyprus, um, in the 1970s, uh, Turkey, um, Turkey's military moved into northern Cyprus and took over some portion of that area. It had been uh, largely aligned with the Greek government, and you know, historically, Greek and, and Turkey have been, have been at odds. Um, so today, the situation is that northern Cyprus is under um, more or less Turkish control. This is not internationally recognized um, by anyone outside of Turkey. Uh, maybe there's a few more. Um, and the situation in OpenStreetMap uh, that we found ourselves in was towns in northern, Cyp in northern Cyprus are all named with Turkish names today. If you go on the, on the ground, all of the street signs will be in Turkish. Um, in the south, the rest of Cyprus, it's in Greek. And a um, expat Brit living in northern Cyprus was mapping what he saw. Um, the other editor was changing all of those names back to, to Greek. His father had been from um, that area, and he felt great pride in the history of, of, um, of that place and of those names, and um, was, yes, like, imp imposing is not the right word, but he was, wanted OpenStreetMap to reflect his, his desires for what Northern Cyprus should be and actually what most of the world like, recognizes as the proper political situation there. So this was a very tricky situation. Um, he asked for help, and um, uh, Andy Robinson, uh, myself, and, and several others got very involved, like, well, what, how do you resolve such a situation? We didn't have a data working group. We had no guidelines. We had no process. Uh, so from the very start, um, and I'm glad like this is still kind of the basis of how we do dispute resolution, there was a lot of like figuring out talking to everyone involved, trying to understand different points of view, um, suggesting solutions. I think one of the first solutions that we said, well, why not just use both names? And we're talking about the default name tag, right? Um, so um, use both Greek and Turkish, and they were both actually amenable to this, but it came down to they could not um, agree on which name would come first. <laughs> so <laughs> we were very close. Um, but uh, we had to actually, in the end, come up with some rule and some decision, and this was the on-the-ground rule, um, which has served, I think, OpenStreetMap very well. Just the idea of you are, if you are there in that place and you are trying to use the map, what's going to be the most useful name? What's going to be the most useful border? It may not be you know, you, the most morally and ethically right way. It may not be the most, like, politically recognized way, but it's the practical thing that we're trying to, trying to map. Um, and, and that also jibes with how OpenStreetMap operates. So that was the origin of the on-the-ground rule. We put together a wiki page on disputes, and, um, and then it's just kind of grown from there. Um, I hope there's no longer any edit words, wars in Cyprus, but I can imagine it pops up from time to time. Wonderful. Thank you for that. So it kind of gives you an idea of uh, the sorts of things that, that we as the data working group deal with. Um, so just to re reiterate that and add on a few things, other uh, sorts of issues that we deal with are licensing. Maybe someone's using copyrighted data or something that uh, doesn't mix with our license, uh, doing any sort of like unauthorized imports or vandalism, and then of course, uh, serious disputes. We also do provide technical assistance. I mean, I mean, the data in the data working group uh, name, we do provide technical assistance at times in terms of change sets that are very large or complex. Someone's made a bunch of edits, and then people have come in and made intermedi uh, intermediary edits. So trying to uh, serve as a point of contact if people do run into issues. And then one of the powers that data working group members do have are uh, short-term blocks, which are really used to get the attention of mappers. So in the case where you've been engaging with someone, they're doing something that's obviously wrong, but they continue to do it, they ignore any sort of comments or, or messages, that block can maybe provide them as a notice uh, where they have to read it before they can continue editing. And that'll 
kind of get their, get their attention or, or kind of nudge them. And then also uh, the, the data working group can redact data uh, as necessary if it is improperly licensed. And then one thing we always look for, so in any sort of dispute, we always want to see some sort of interaction first with the other party. So if someone is coming to us and saying that there's an issue with another mapper, we generally like you to attempt at least solving that. Whether the other person replies or not, that's a different story. But just looking for, for some engagement first. And then uh, another case in general, I mean, beyond naming uh, different things is just border situations in general. And this kind of goes into the, I guess, the second half of uh, my talk abstract, but looking towards international borders, I mean, what I have displayed here is the South China Sea, the Spratly Islands, where it's obviously an area of strong contention between many different countries. And I pulled this off uh, a news website, kind of just displaying some of the different claims uh, with China with this nine dash line here, uh, which was recently invalidated by an international court. But then we have all these other claims here that the court didn't really even touch in terms of saying uh, what belongs to other people. The OpenStreetMap Foundation uh, board did approve a resolution in 2013 here to provide some guidance, at least for uh, countries or other people interested about how we deal uh, with disputed territories in these situations. But as I mentioned, even about like this, this nine dash line, uh, international systems don't even necessarily define borders either. They don't, if you look to the United Nations or all these different bodies, they might not have one set of borders or they might have a mixture. Um, or what happens if you start producing new land or if you're on a volcanic island and it uh, you know, makes a lot more land? How are those situations dealt with? And in either case, there's always going to be some sort of conflict. Um, people are always going to have different opinions about these sorts of things. Um, but getting to kind of the core of the issue, oftentimes the issue is just with a rendering. I mean, borders aren't necessarily on the ground, in some cases we might have fences or, or demarcations, but in essence we are just trying to map administrative boundaries. So for now we generally follow um, this policy which is sort of de facto that's uh, basically looking at just on the ground situations, so, so what's going on there. And um, we try to meet reality which again may not be um, what some people view as that, but we want to try to capture the things that are, uh, are going on on the ground. And the other uh, thing here is that, you know, we're just a database. We're not authoritative. We're not saying that these borders are explicitly this case. We're just trying to provide some data for people to look at. Now, looking at this last line here, in the future, we may look at supporting alternative sets directly. Um, I think that's something that we might want to move towards uh, sometime in the near future, especially with uh, vector maps becoming more popular. So in terms of international borders for the future, one thing would be just to keep this status quo principle of de facto borders. So looking at on the ground situation, um, something that I've seen on the mailing list before, this postal principle. So if you want to mail a letter to someone in some territory, what sort of country do you put on that letter? What country is providing postal service? Those sorts of things. The second one would be to create uh, super relations that hold these different viewpoints. So say you have a country, um, you have in one case, uh, a relation that defines this de facto border that is kind of what re what's rendered on uh, osm.org. But then there's also this country's uh, view of the border. So what you could do is say if you had a vector tiles, you could have essentially different localizations for each country. So if someone was visiting a map from China, they could pull in the China vectors uh, for borders. Or if someone was visiting it um, from somewhere in Europe, they could pull in, say, the Belgian borders and see those different things. And then finally, um, we could just get rid of them altogether uh, since they're not even on the ground. So that's something that's also been bounced around before and, and it could be a possibility. So with that, I guess I will uh, finish up. Thank you.
Yeah, I guess we can do a few questions now. Thank you. This was uh, very interesting, I have to say. Um, so the main uh, phrase I'm going to remember from this is physical control. Uh, this is how you, this is the principle that is behind uh, everything you, you do, it seems, uh, DWG. Um, but what about your interactions with uh, you know, the US state or with legal uh, arrangements? Um, how do you integrate them in your, in your process? Thanks a lot. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it depends on the situation. Uh, in, in most of these cases, we have usually, uh, one member of the team has provided, uh, you know, some of their time to actually research these more in depth. I mean, most, uh, most of these, these border rules can't necessarily be applied uniformly across all situations. So I think in every case, it just requires looking at it more closely, someone um, doing some research to see all these different, uh, you know, situations going on, the different claims, that sort of thing, to see what, what's happening there. Um, so I don't think there's a, a complete uniform set that, that we can apply to these sorts of agreements. Since I've been on the receiving end of some of the complaints with, uh, sorry, I should know better. Uh, so uh, I've been on the receiving end of some of the complaints, so that's why I have uh, a comment here, and I was co-author of that document. Um, I, I think a useful way of looking at it is actually one which actually works, particularly, say, northern Cyprus. You're a tourist, you're on Cyprus, you're in your car, you have a map in your sat lab system, and you really want to know if you're staying in the same country or not. And you, it's not a useful information to know, okay, the southern part, southern part of Cyprus doesn't believe that there's a northern part, because you'll just get shot when you drive over the border. And uh, I think that's something which works well as an argument. The people that have been proposing adding all these disputed boundaries to OSM don't understand that there's essentially no country in the world which doesn't actually have a border conflict. Switzerland has one with Italy. You know, and they're not fighting about it, but they're still there. And it just it would actually open the Pandora's box because then you would give people the possibility to say, yeah, but you'd be showing that set that's in OSM and not the set that my neighbor country has. So uh, I'm very much for keeping the current status quo. Yeah, and I just kind of agree with, with your statement, especially about traveling, because that, that's what we're, you know, that's what we envision with OpenStreetMap is what, if people are going to be using this data, how will that affect them locally? Hi. Um, what is your approach for situations where the official street names, for instance, uh, are different from what is used by people orally, for instance, on the ground? Uh, in terms of language or just the specific name? I'd rather amend the names. Like maybe the street is named, I don't know. One way and then yeah, it might be also awesome. yeah. Uh, I mean, or, or the language also maybe yeah. Yeah, just I I think the tagging schema provides a good opportunity for that. Looking at like names, alt names, specific localized names. In terms of whether a, a name should be uh, an old name should be applied to the actual name, like in parentheses or something, I think would depend on the situation. But but there are tags that can be used to distinguish between those. I'm also on the data working group and have dealt with uh, street names in a few cases. Generally, for the name tag, it's um, what is the signed there on the ground. I mean, that doesn't mean that if someone vandalizes a name tag by writing a letter and it's fixed next week, we would change the name tag. But just because City Hall has decided all these streets now are renamed, but hasn't actually changed the signage, 
you would, in that case, keep the name tag and maybe add an official name tag. Where it gets complicated is where you have one street, multiple name tags that all disagree. And there's not a great solution there. Um, this isn't somewhere like Belgium. This is somewhere like uh, generally Eastern Europe where you have one name on street signs, you have one name on the side of houses, you have one name on addresses, you have another name um, yeah, that the city believes it is, and none of these may agree. Um, and because these are, uh, this also gets into multiple languages and cultural identity, uh, people can feel very strongly about this, so it's hard to come to a resolution that everyone agrees on. Whereas in, for Belgium, what they have, there are multiple names here, but um, there is agreement on how to do that. One last question. Maybe just a, not, not a question, but just a, a comment. I recently saw a documentary about how Google Map manages such situation. And I thought it was quite interesting. So, of course, you have the, the, this situation occurs in many places. And the way they have solved it is to show a different map depending on uh, from who uh, is checking the map. So, if it's, uh, if, let's take the example of Crimea, which was, uh, has been annexed by Russia. Uh, if, you, if you check the map from Russia or from Crimea, you will see it as part of Russia. If you check it from the rest of the world, you see it as a still part of Ukraine, which is in a way quite, pragma quite pragmatic because it's what you would see if you were checking a, a paper map, probably you, you would have that. In Russia, you would, you, would, you would get a Russian map which shows Crimea as part of, of, of Russia and in the rest of the world, the reverse. So, okay, but uh, of course, it's, I don't know if it's easy to implement or if, if that's the, the way that should be followed here, but it's, it's just an example of how they, they do it. Yeah, and I think the other thing I could kind of bring up here is a lot of this is focused, or, or a lot of this can be mitigated based on who is actually rendering the map. So, you know, anyone could take the database, they can modify it how they want, or they can just render all these different localizations like you mentioned. Um, I think the issue that happens, though, is that people just go to the osm.org map, and if it's not right on there, then they think that the data is, you know, completely wrong. But I think that's a good solution, especially when countries start dictating that, that data has to be right. A quick follow-up right. while uh, Frederick yeah, is going to stage, yeah. and I will thank it then. Uh, there is actually some map rendering software that does just that uh, from some people in Japan, I think. And if it's from a Japanese IP, it does this. And if it's because there's a islands, there's a dispute. Um, so there is software that does that. So, thank you, Ethan.